Yes. Min, and wh why don't you uh, identify yourself before you ask your question? Uh, actually, if you could wait for a microphone oh. there. Oh, this helps. I, I have been coughing, so my throat is a little bit sore now. Um, does, does this work? It's, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is great panel. Thanks, Liz, for organizing this, and I get to meet all these experts on China and India. Um, I have um, uh, to each of you. who teaches uh, Chinese politics at Boston University. And also China and India's political economy. Uh, the several works uh, uh, by this audience are, are used in that course. Yeah. Syllabus, but anyway, um, so I have I uh, I have a question uh, slash comments to each of this uh, audience, uh, each of the speaker. Maybe I'll start with Terence because I, I heard Terence talk many times, uh, several times before. So I won't be uh, asking a question about your talk about your last comments on human capital going into the state, which I think is very true because the Chinese. After the when the when the government became so resourceful, uh, the, the talent has been attracted to the state. But isn't there too much talent being attracted to the state? Today I see the state consumed so many talents from the society, while the private sectors are are, are being victim of this state absorption. Um, so, um, what kind of balance we can expect between the state and society? And uh, to um, to Professor Huang, uh, uh, I I really I, mean, I like your comments and I agree with all you said. Um, the inf on the infrastructure point, but when I was uh, conducting my field research in India, and all the people were asking me, you know, how could you endure the infrastructure in India? I lived in Delhi, and I, my response to them. The, this was very similar to the 1980s Wenzhou, and I grew up at Wenzhou in the 1980s. That's where the Wenzhou people were making money. Uh, and uh, when I <laughs> lived there, and I saw all these uh, kiosks and uh, the, the rickshaws and pulling stuff around, that's where the money was made. Um, so my, I agree with you, the infrastructure was not needed, but the market was needed. And uh, all the panelists, uh, when, you, when we talk about the growth, growth or entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship arises because the markets. When so people are the, were the same today and as in the 1980s, but today it's much harder for them to make, make money. Why? Because the markets were shrinking. Uh, the, the opportunity for them to make money. And that, that's where the state has played more uh, bad effects rather than the good today than, than before. Um, to uh, Professor Dora, um, I, I think I'm most struck by your big argument which you didn't e elaborate on the social network or the informal uh, net network in rural China. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, w what you said was absolutely true because uh, um, the place I grew up and people went to business and all their money were from their relatives. Uh, but my point is, uh, in India, you see the same very vibrant social networks, right? The extended family ties, the diaspora connections, and in the IT sector, in India, it's very successful. And in the IT sector, the, uh, the, the social network worked very well for, for the Indians in the urban area, like uh, the relatives pool together the resources to train IT professionals to take advantage of the same. Why this did not happen to other uh, industries? So what's the plus to the social network? Um, I, you know, uh, I don't have much to add beyond the following anecdotal observation. Every time we have a, I have an audience in China, mostly composed of Chinese, and I ask how many of you would, the way I phrase it is, how many of you would voluntarily want your children to join the state somehow, some version, find the correct language? It's almost always 100% uh, <laughs> raise their hand, presumably because of the inst economic instrumentality of doing it and getting ahead. In India, that answer is always 0%. Uh, <laughs> always. I mean, give or take a political family or somebody who's very close uh, has some extraordinary reason to do it. And in the US, it's about a third. Um, you know, a third of the people raise their hand and say this. And I, I think that says something about the grand allocation of talent uh, in the country. 
so that's just a, a datum as opposed to uh, you know a comment. But I agree with you. There has to be a balance. Uh, I'll, I'll stop with that. I mean, first of all, I'm very happy to meet the academic from Wenzhou. <laughs> 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 There's another one. Right? Oh, okay, all right, okay. So, uh, okay, so I'm happy to meet too. <laughs> um, and uh, um, so we, you know, we are always afraid of when Joe when we negotiate with them um, uh, about business deals. Uh, and I, I think the, your characterization of Wenzhou is absolutely right. And, and the if you run statistical analysis of of China and and looking at the uh, quality and quantity of infrastructures, and then try to correlate that with, uh, with their later subsequent performance, you, can't prob you cannot tell that there is a positive uh, correlation. And the Wenzhou had bad infrastructures. It was surrounded by mountains on three sides. And they didn't have an airport, I think, until 1998. And it was a public-private construction of the infrastructure. So it's it's a little bit like what's going on in India now, which is a demand-driven infrastructure building, as opposed to be a supply-driven, which is you build these things and then good things will happen. So in Wenzhou, it's really you have economic needs in excess of what local infrastructure can support, and then you have the money, you have the resources to build them. I'm more inclined to accept that way of building infrastructures. The reason is that the when we say uh, building infrastructures, we're not saying you know two bridges are worse than one bridge or two airports are worse than one airport. That's not the right trade-off. The right trade-off is: Do you want to build one more airport, or do you want to build four thousand primary schools in the rural area? Right. So that's the trade-off. And if you put that trade-off out, I think most reasonable. Sensible people will say, in India, the bottleneck is the base education rather than infrastructures. The problem with the fra framing is that most people say, uh, do you want more airports uh, as compared with less airports? Do you want more highway as compared with less highway? Obviously, if you frame the question that way, more airports probably are better than less airports. More highway is probably better than less highway. But I think this is the wrong way to frame the question entirely. India, especially for India, this is a government that has a chronic budget deficit, right? Five to six percent structural budget deficit. If you do more of the infrastructures, you're going to do less on education. That's just, that just the arithmetic fact. And my worry about the Indian policy elites is that they learn the wrong Chinese lesson. And they are devoting their political attentions, uh, financial attention, financial resources, to arguably important things. Right? It's very interesting if you poll the Indian entrepreneurs. The, the number one constraint, survey after survey, is not infrastructures. It's actually human capital. So, there's a mismatch, I think, you know, with the, with the current government in India. You have a very, I don't quite understand. I mean, just, you have a very strong kind of authoritarian kind of a government <laughs> looking at infrastructures rather than looking at human capital. Uh, yeah, um, I just just a quick response to uh, to Yasheng's point. I don't think that there is a lack of commitment they, uh, to education in India. There is an enormous amount of, you know, they're putting in lots of money in education. The problem is delivery. I mean, why is it that teachers don't yeah. come to teach? Absolutely. Why is it that all these positions are... I mean, so it really has to do with something more. It has to do with the kind of how do you create an incentive structure? How do you incentivize people to do their work? Yeah. Right? Uh, obviously, you need it at some level. You know, in the socialist period, people got educated, I think, because of some commitments and some controls, right? Uh, India has never been able to figure out that issue of how you incentivize. I mean, what is an incentive? It goes way back. I mean, that, you know, Tarun's statement that so few people in India are interested in getting education if it's available. Whereas in China, everybody wants it. Um, I mean, 
can that really be divorced from going way back? And to you your mean social on? structure? Yeah, social and the, the but, premium on education that goes back for millennia in China. I see. Uh, and the whole Communist Party in China, it seems to me in some ways, its mobilization was based initially on delivering education. To yeah, exactly. It was enormously powerful. I think, I, uh, yeah, I think, of all of those, I think all people. of those things are true. Of course, there are, and what you do see, and I don't know that anybody's done this, but the kinds of, you know, who are the <coughs> aspirational communities in India and who are the non-aspirational? And that has very much to do with the caste systems, right? And you can see it very much, and that even if you don't build schools, these people will go. And now more and more, but there's also, but it's more immediate. I would say, I would not fully agree with that. That's not it. Because now you have poor people, untouchables, other kinds of poor people in India, who will not put, if they can afford it, they will not, not put their children in public schools, because the teachers don't come there. They will put them but in expensive the private schools. Because, because there's no there is status a, in society, right? I mean, can you imagine a Chinese that's, teacher that's the not problem, showing I up? Think. I, I think the, I, I think but I didn't answer her question. Anyway, Shall I quickly please, answer please that? Sorry. I think I, I think it's related also. So I'm I'm glad we've opened this up. I mean, I think it is a very important issue to try and understand what is you know the problem with the Indian system. But uh, to answer your issue, I think uh, is that actually there is you know the Indian economy was used to be a very developed one in many sectors. Uh, I mean historically. Um, uh, you know, according to Angus Madison, it was the biggest economy in the world in the first millennium, and then was close uh, still till 1500 or so. But the point is that you've had a very, once again, a sectoralized uh, differentiation. You've had caste differentiations, you've had communities. The kinds of Indian business communities are is probably unparalleled in the world because unlike say Chinese business communities and so on, where wealth is not kept for more than three generations, these guys have had it for many generations, you know? They, they really, and they've been spread all over the world for a long time. So there have been, and they have social infrastructure, right, for social networks and social infrastructure. There are two problems here. One is that nobody's done any work on this kind of thing. There's Mario Rutan has done something on rural, entrepreneurs in Gujarat and so on, and the kind of equivalent to the cultural nexus in talking about how they use re resources and so on, but nobody has done it. Uh, but the point is that, it's not, that is, it's not something that is entirely inclusive. In China, of course, it's also not entirely inclusive, but you're not prevented by caste and community from joining that. So those things do make a difference.